Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Denny. There's no Freya this week, but we are joined by a special guest, David, from Fanboy Films, to talk about restoring older animation and live action. Hello, David. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good. Why don't you start us off with, just you tell us a little bit about Femboy Films, uh, just what you do in general as Ian said you restore film, but what does that mean specifically? Okay, well, it's a bit of a long-winded discussion about all this. Uh, it's, it's just a sh- a so much to go into, mm. um, but I run a, a fan group on the internet, mainly Twitter, called Femboy Films. We do film restoration, mostly focused on older Japanese um, animation. Um, so you have your, you know, your guys who do like, you know, the Star Wars stuff, the, you know, 4K 77 and all that. Mm-hmm. And on Original Trilogy, which is a website, like a forum where a bunch of film nerds gather, there's a lot of people who um, want to restore like old movies and stuff from film prints. And I thought, you know, there's not a group for this for anime specifically, and there's a lot that can be achieved if we like wanted to do something like this. So I decided, why don't I make my own group focused on, you know, this, but for anime, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I mean, I can get into the origin and all that later if you guys want to ask that later. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess like the question we always ask people when they show up is just how did you get into anime in, in the in the first place? Um, was it Dragon Ball Z on Cartoon Network or what? It was Cartoon Network, but it wasn't Dragon Ball Z. It was Naruto. I am one uh, of those uh, like like post like you know older Toonami generation. So okay. I never really grew up with Dragon Ball Z or Gundam Wing or Sailor Moon or whatever. For me, it was mostly um, Naruto when it was on Toonami and also Pokemon um, when it was on Kids WB. And honestly, Kids WB, uh, Fox Kids, th- that honestly got me more into it than anything else did. So I watched Sonic X a lot, Kirby right back at you. One Piece was on there, yeah. Um, but I never really watched it. But yeah, just just TV, really, like, you know. A lot of people get into it, got into it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm a little younger than a lot of the people that got into Toonami when it was like, you know, at its peak. I was mainly one of those kids who grew up with Naruto, and I still really love Naruto. <laughs> it definitely seems to have been like the gateway for a lot of people. <laughs> You've mentioned that this forum that you were a part of, um, Original Trilogy, but like, what was it that like got you interested in film restoration in the first place? Like, do you have a background in working with film? Did you study film? So yeah, in college I went to um, I went to film school, but the thing about film school nowadays is that usually they don't teach you anything about older like mediums. So, Hmm. for example, there's like almost no chance you will ever like handle a real film Mm -hmm. print or learn how to splice film or like cut film like physically. It's all digital now. And it's been that way for the past more than a decade. Um, Everything changed digital after Avatar happened. So, yeah, nowadays they they're they don't just kind of like in the history books you'll see it kind of but then uh after that you're you're you they teach you stuff that's like relevant today most most people don't shoot on film anymore unless they're actually going for that aesthetic specifically or using it for an effect or if you're like a big director like tarantino or christopher nolan then you mm-hmm. always shoot on film because you can afford it and it's really expensive to do that nowadays um so not many people really care or do it anymore except for film nerds um and so there's this one class that i took in 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 college it was a cinematography class where we uh actually got to shoot on 16 millimeter um for our final project 
And uh, I thought it was a really cool experience because I, it was something that I've never done before, something that I, I will likely never in my life get to do again. Um, and ever since I saw that like like projection of what we shot like at the end of the semester, we actually got to saw to see like a like a projection of it, and I was like, this is so so cool. So that's when I started like researching film and like getting into like you know how film restoration kind of like works because it's a relatively new like art I would say especially now that we're in the HD era moving into the 4k era it's getting more and more relevant I'd mm-hmm. say and also more and more press a pressing matter because older films they will eventually um, decompose and they will eventually uh, fade into dust literally like yeah. not even exaggerating um, so now it's like I'd say it's more important than ever for people to learn about and understand film restoration and how how everything like kind of comes together, you know? It's kind of like uh, climate change. It's a now or never. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's now or never. Sure, yeah. Especially with Japanese films in particular. Japan is a very hot and humid country. Yeah. It is not an ideal place to store film prints at all. Uh, so I've encountered so many, like, so many very sad prints that we've come across that have just been like, God, this is so sad. But yeah, we tr- we try to like get what we can before it's too late, mm-hmm. you know. And that's basically the story of how I got into it. I mean, also, I mean, m- most of the anime that I am interested in personally is older and um came before the digital era so i was always kind of aware that oh this like these works before like you know things started being like drawn on computers were always like you know uh, drawn on cells and like they were actually like every frame was uh literally a picture that was taken Mm -hmm. by a camera um and printed to film and stuff so i was kind of always aware about that and this kind of like new experience that I had with actual film kind of like re re emerged within me like an interest in it. So I kind of am using that now, like fueling that with this uh, this group that I run, this project that uh, that we're doing or the projects that we're doing, etc. So I think that's enough. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, that's really interesting. But as you said, you're like working in a group, so. How many people are there in like fanboy films and do you mm-hmm. all do like similar things or are roles clearly divided and uh, like do you work at the same time does work dependent on what the other person is, has done yeah so we're 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 made up like of a few dozen people but a lot of those people like are mainly people who like donate to mm-hmm. us uh, frequently, but the majority of the actual work that's done is only done by a few people. I would say that maybe four or five people maximum are the core of the group and like would actually like get everything done. Like the people with the, with the skill set. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we, we all have like very similar skill sets and we can all do the same thing, but we do we do like split up the roles in in what we think is the strongest skill of what each person has so we have our one guy who is the scanner who um who mainly like if you go through me if you want to scan something i will send it to him i'll send the reel to him and he will scan it and he will like prepare all the like the digital files and stuff and like get all the like thumbnail images together to make like a movie file out of it. And I would say that I mainly for the group do actual like, you know, dirt and scratch removal and stuff like that. That's what I've kind of like fell into, though I can do other stuff as well. Um, and then we have our the guy who like color corrects like he's the probably one of the best colorists i know in the anime community and he's just helped us a lot with all that stuff he 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 can pull off some stuff that i've like i don't know how he does it yeah so i would say that we all do similar things but we mainly take on a specific role whenever we want to restore something you know also i would say that yes it is dependent on 
on like what gets done first because obviously we can't do any scratch removal without the movie file and we also can't well we could color correct before but i feel like it's usually what our pipeline was is is we do scratch removal and dirt removal first and then we do mm -hmm. color correction after that's just how it's worked but i think they're interchangeable okay so i think one thing that's sort of been implied by what you've been saying is that this is uh, all done like primarily digital. This isn't like a, a physical restoration process primarily. It's scan it and then see what you can do. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, mainly because we don't really, you know, we're not, we don't have the, the knowledge or like, you know, because because film is like a chemistry kind of, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. like it's it's yeah. developed with chemical processes. If you want to restore film physically, it's a chemical process and we're no scientists. So we we're, we're not really like well educated on on that sort of thing although we have tried a few things here and there just to experiment but we're not really well endowed in that in that kind of field so it so yeah we we mainly do things digitally once everything is scanned so that's yeah it, it is a pretty it, it is a digital process yeah i would say mm -hmm. it's uh very expensive to do the uh the physical restoration as well and uh we have gone through other people if we need something physically done. Like I, I posted a, a like a week ago or so this this image of this all of this film all tangled <laughs> up and like, oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and like we we're like, what the actual hell is this? <laughs> so we sent it over to um, Tokyo Laboratory, who is basically the biggest film laboratory in Japan, who have worked on anime since like the beginning of time basically and so they they were able to like roll it back up and into a an, onto a onto a core and everything for us and it, i would say it's not cheap to do that but i mean it has to be done you know mm -hmm. if we want to like save this stuff it's 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 a mission <laughs> Just as like a sort of a final point on this um, sort of physical stuff, uh, I've noticed that I think it was with Sally the Witch you mentioned that like this humidity stuff like leads to like mold growing on it, or there's this uh, thing called vinegar syndrome where the film is literally decomposing. Was that something that this uh, Tokyo lab was handling for you, or was this something you were trying to do yourself? Uh, no, and actually I haven't really thought to reach out to them about this. I don't know how much it would cost to do this like extensive cleanup on it because it, no matter what we tried and this is what i was saying when we were experimenting we we tried to get like a solution to like remove all the mold and stuff but the mold has seeped so deep into the film itself that it is impossible to get out with, with our ability anyway um when we scanned it initially yeah it was it was full of mold like completely like I couldn't remove it all digitally. It's just mm. impossible. So mm. the only way to restore that would be a physical process. And like I said, we're not very, we're not there and we don't know mm. if we will be there. So I'm not sure how much we can fix this specific thing though. I have done some tests and I've been able to get rid of some stuff, some of the mold and whatnot on like digitally, but it's just not, the software we use or it's not really the software limitations but really just it can't really detect what is mold and what's not it's not meant to do that it's meant for scratches and dirt and stuff so like it's not very helpful and we we i think that the only possible way to like get it pristine again is is to try finding somewhere that will like try to help like physically remove all the mold but i don't even know if that's possible at this point this this thing is like so messed up and so i'm not really sure what to do with it it's just kind of like been on a stance standstill you know yeah i mean this is sort of what you were saying about um presumably this reel is coming from japan originally because it's it's selling yeah. the witch and it's a very humid country <laughs> right yeah and this this thing has been around since the 60s so yeah I mean, that was going to be my next question. You've said already that you get like a bunch of this stuff donated to you, but are these like commissions by other people who want you to restore their film for them? Just donation wise, I think at one point I saw you acquired an archive of over a thousand, like a giant, <laughs> essentially just a storage cupboard full of film. Or is this, or do you look for something to restore because you're interested in it? So there's multiple ways you can work with us. Uh, like like the the main thing that we do is and and the thing that costs the most money usually is uh we um 
we scour auction websites like eBay or usually it's Yahoo Auctions Japan since we mm. like we're focused on uh, anime. Um, and we just see like, is that does did this ever get a DVD release? Was it only on VHS? Was it only on Laserdisc? Does it need to be? restored and will the company that made it ever care yeah. enough to do it if all these um criteria are met then we will go ahead and and do our best anyway to to win the auction or um if if we can't afford it ourselves then the group that uh, the the rest of the group that i was talking about that doesn't really do anything but donate they will step in and help us um with yeah. donations that we need so it all it's all dependent on on auctions that come up so we're we're largely waiting for stuff to just show up out of nowhere and a lot mm. of stuff that we have gotten has been like just complete lucky finds on on yahoo auctions like oh crap this is this movie is here let's buy it like this movie <laughs> is here etc so like either it's either that or people who like message us and like they're like we have a film that we want to like restore or scan or whatever and um then they ask what our rates are and stuff. And mm -hmm. and we do have a service where for a rate, like a specific rate would, depending on whether, what format it is, eight, 16, 35, whatever. Um, we will definitely go ahead and scan whatever the hell you want. My philosophy is if it matters to you, it matters in general. So we will, we, we take whatever uh, a client will give to us mm -hmm. as long as they're okay with paying for it. <laughs> I think this explains, like, for me, why the uh, the projects you've had have been somewhat eclectic. Um, like, just thinking about what's on your YouTube right now, there was um, a bunch of uh, Disney trailers. There's um, the that uh, was it American Pop, the the Ralph Bakshi uh, thing. There's mm -hmm. a yeah. six minute football jamboree thing, which I was watching earlier. That's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, what's the common thread? I guess the common thread is it's what we could get. <laughs> yeah. Um. Sp speaking of that, like thousand real like lot, that was a completely random like eBay find that we found, and uh, we yeah. just kind of just wanted to like try try it out and see what what we could find in it. And we've gone through the whole thing, and most of it are film negatives from stuff that I've never heard of or don't yeah. know anything about. But we did find some really cool stuff in there too, in the midst of that. None of it is anime, but mm -hmm. um, it's pretty cool. Like I, we have some uh, Akira Kurosawa stuff in there. Oh, nice. On 35, which is pretty awesome. I don't know when we'll ever get to scanning that because there are obviously more things that need our attention. But um, it's there and it's being preserved Obviously, this is an anime podcast, but I have to confess, the stuff that like, got me most excited is just weird commercials. <laughs> uh. Those are pretty interesting movie prints that we've gotten. So, like, for example, um, I'd, we'd win an auction on Yahoo Auctions for the specific movie, and included in the reel was this just, like, random commercial or random ad that was just spliced in, like, that the collector himself would be like... I don't want to like have these on separate rolls, so I'll just put them on this reel on this random reel. And like, thanks to that, we've gotten those like little like really cool like you know those trailers for um like the Shonen Jump stuff and the uh, Toei like festival stuff that like isn't supposed to be there, but this collector was like, why don't I put it there anyway? So it's like really cool. I, when I was like flicking through your uh, Twitter um, the other day, I think the first thing that I saw is in like the earliest thing I saw was like Dr. Slump. Was there any specific reason for that? Because I noticed that didn't quite make it onto to YouTube. I don't think it was just. So, yeah, the, the whole the whole reason this group is, exists in the first place was that um, the, a friend of mine, the color correctionist that I was talking about earlier, he was just start browsing through Yahoo auctions and he suddenly stumbled upon this 16 millimeter Dr. Slump special like traffic safety thing that he was like, Hey, why don't we like, cause to be honest, we, our origins lie in like the Dragon Ball Z community mm. and Dragon Ball Z is a show that is completely cursed with terrible releases. And so we were wondering like, 
so we're obsessed with like film and stuff because of that mainly <laughs> i forgot to mention that earlier but um that's why we were like okay this is a 16 millimeter thing that will never be like restored properly so why don't we try to like scan it ourselves and so i won the, the reel for like a really low price surprisingly i didn't have anyone beating against me so that was the very first thing that i actually got scanned it wasn't us initially because at the time we didn't have our own scanner so i had to like look for scanners in the area and uh, eventually we settled on this one person whose rates were low enough that i was okay with it uh, it's not cheap but still so yeah we got that scan and initially i was like okay we're gonna like restore this and it's gonna be great and we're gonna like upload it and stuff um but then we actually started to work on it and there are these like really really deep scratches on the side that are very difficult to remove and we haven't really had the time or the when I'm, mainly it's a time thing we and other stuff is a little more important now that we just like haven't like gotten around to removing those deep deep scratches and they are like hell hella difficult to remove it's not like you can click on them and they're gone like you have to do some frame by frame magic on that so that's the reason why it's not been uploaded it's because we're just we just haven't had the time or the to uh to really like focus in on and on and on uh, and um you know yeah that's restore it. it properly so i'm not sure that's another thing like with all with all the pro like the film stuff that we have it's very like we don't restore we don't plan on restoring like everything we have mainly because oh. there's just too much so is so all the stuff that i've uploaded on youtube right now is like just little stuff sure but um a lot most of that is not touched whatsoever so i didn't do any color correction i didn't hmm. do any dirt removal so you can still see a bunch of scratches on it and stuff which is fine but like for bigger stuff that we want to actually like take the time to like refine and like make perfect and stuff that takes a very long time and everyone has their own jobs and their own life and whatnot so it's really a matter of like using our spare time wisely and um right now anyway i'm not sure what to do with dr slopes like should i just upload it as like as it is like with all the dirt and gunk and crap all over it or should we you know try to make it look a little nicer it, that and that's like the the main thing with a lot of these stuff the stuff that we have that i haven't really and i'm not sure what to do with we 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 really have to like be like specifically like choose what projects to focus on and what we can just like get out there we haven't really gotten to a like a point where we have gotten anything like really big out there yet and uh the the one chance that we did is now gone <laughs> so yeah we'll, we'll we'll come back to that one in a little bit uh right now we're just in a little bit of a uh not sure where where to go from here kind of mm -hmm. situation so you're talked a lot about how time is obviously the big issue but I, i've been wondering like in terms of like which parts of the pipeline tend to do tend to take the most is this just it depends <laughs> or does do you notice that like dirt removal takes longer than color correction or Fill me in here. On the usual project, it would be that the dirt and stuff takes the longest because no process is perfect. And a lot of the time, an automatic like filter is going to mess up. And I've been frustrated so much because there's this one frame where it messed up and like I can't go <laughs> back on it. And now I have to disable the filter and no, nothing I do to the filter makes it better. And if I put it down too much, then it won't detect the, the scratches i need and stuff yeah. so it's like a lot of the time you have to default to doing it manually which obviously is very time consuming and takes up way too much time <laughs> and effort like that um like the, this is frame by frame right yeah exactly so like that attacker you opening that i uploaded was almost completely frame by frame restored it took me i think three whole days like Oof. of work to do that and it's like a minute and a half like just imagine like doing it for like longer material you know that's why we decided we thought that daikon 3 was like a, it's it's a lot of effort and it'll take a lot of time but at least it's only five minutes long and it's like we can make it perfect mm. without like killing ourselves speaking of frames i was wondering if there's a difference between restoring like western media like the parker hunters trailer and 
anime, like the Detective Conan trailer, due to the differences in how they were animated? Like, is there a noticeable time difference you find? And also with respect to the live action commercials and stuff. Okay, so I would say that these software are very optimized for live action. So a lot of the time, those those filters that I was talking about, they are like perfect and they will not fail if it's live action. Mm. But animation is very, very finicky because the way these things work is if I put an automatic filter on it, the way it works is it'll take the data from neighboring frames and kind of like re reconstruct an image from the data from those other frames, thus removing the dirt and scratches that exist mm. on uniquely were the positioned on on another on a specific frame but if an animation is done on once it obviously doesn't have other frames to like yeah. reference as as data um so if there's a fast movement or like someone's getting punched really fast or something like that it will always without a doubt 100 percent fail and it will not work and it will <laughs> remove detail that is supposed to be there and it's it is so frustrating because a lot of the, most of the time anime isn't like animated on ones. It, it's yeah. usually on threes, sometimes twos, but occasionally there will be a shot that is animated on ones. That's, you know, to emulate a fast movement and every single time it will mess up. And it really sucks because like, if it wasn't for that, and if it was just a little bit like more refined and optimized, it could avoid the, this issue and, and it would be like so much faster and so much easier to, to deal with. But because of animation, like the timing really mattering to like simulate movement, it's like a lot of the time it won't work. And that's why you, like manual restoration is the way to go despite it taking forever um and with disney stuff western stuff a lot of that is done on ones more often than anime is so i would say that like mo most of the time it's going to take far longer to do something western than it mm. is something japanese but it really depends on the specific like work and and all that there's kind of an irony there because the point of like animating on ones is to try and make it as smooth as possible to make it feel as real as possible. And here we're saying that this is what's screwing us over rather than the more choppy uh, limited animation style. Yeah, I love it when when uh, there's just panning shots that like have no movement because <laughs> it's so easy to get rid of dirt and scratches with those. But if there's like a lot of movement and a lot of stuff happening, then oh my god especially if there's like effects like rocks falling or yeah. like things just just moving too fast it will not it won't have a fun time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um like sort of one maybe last one last technical point is uh, i'm very interested in like how the sort of color correction process is working here uh i noticed that like we already mentioned icon is the Sometimes you've been able to access like the official palettes or compared to the VHS, but is color correction educated guesswork or is it a lot of research to dial down exactly what the, the colors are? All right. Well, Daikon 3 was a very, is, it's not even done, it's, it, it's a super complicated um, thing because there aren't a lot of color references that are accurate per se. And the film print that we had personally was a pretty pretty faded, um, so it t it's taking a lot of effort and time to like get it right. I would say I'm I'm not exactly an expert on on what like the the process that my uh, my colleague is uh, doing with it, but I mean if you saw the screenshots. They look pretty, There's, pretty nice, nicely, nicely yeah, fixed. Yeah. Up. I think my favorite one though was the image that you posted for was the Pokemon Celebi movie. That was night and day, mm, <laughs> right? Yeah, and that was something that I did. Uh, not it wasn't him, but uh, I did. I, the funny thing about color correction is I did that with no references, so I just kind of like made the whites white and it kind of <laughs> worked. Um, a lot of the time with color correction, the first thing you should always do is make sure that, they, that your whites are actually white and they're not like yellow or green or tinted any other color. And a lot of the time, that's that's enough to make your the animation look a lot better. Mm. Um, I recently, um, for Disco Tech, I um, color corrected um, the first Urusei Yatsuda movie and uh, it was very, very tinted green 
And like, if you saw, if you see the screenshots that Brady posted like a few months ago, I'd say, I think it's just so, so yeah. much better. And I don't know when that Blu-ray is coming out, but like, yeah. I'm sure it'll yeah. wow some people. But anyway, first thing you should always do is white balance. And then what we do is we usually take references like cells, like scans of those, or like, you know, booklets and materials that we can find with like original colors. And, it, and it's even more um, helpful if, if there are, if we find like ref, like color sheets where like they would put the code of the color, like yeah. the paint that they used right next yeah. to it, because there are charts online that say what, what color these correspond mm. to. And it's very helpful when you have something like that, so that we can match it to, but it is hard to um, make sure that like, if you're, altering one color not to mess up another one and that's what my my colleague is really good at and i don't really know how he separates colors so well but he's he's pretty good at that so once you've restored the film like what happens afterwards what happens with both the physical film reel because that has to go somewhere do you just archive that in a storage bin somewhere and what happens with the restored project because obviously it can't a lot of longer stuff couldn't possibly be uploaded to youtube and things like that yeah, so um, with every film reel that we get or we buy, because we do return client ones, mm -hmm, of course, but like stuff that we get for ourselves, we always keep with the scanner who has who. First of all, he lives in a state where it's where it's the the climate is like okay enough to store them. I live in California, so there's no way that I could. I wouldn't want to <laughs> yeah, to yeah. subject my film prints to uh to such a such a hot climate. So I would um I'd always send all my stuff to him and he he lives somewhere where he can store it and it'd be fine. Yeah, so he keeps all that stuff. He has storage. Um he has like all the thousand plus reels that we have pretty much. And uh, with restoration projects, that's a thing. Like we haven't really, aside from like little stuff that I posted on YouTube and Daikon Three, which was like the first big thing that we've done or that we we were planning to finish. Mm -hmm. We haven't really done a lot of restoration projects per se, other than just scanning stuff. So like all the smaller things that I've put out, yeah, like that stuff we've we we've already put out. Like I said, we just don't have the time or to to really like make this a a thing like that we like focus on all the time. So most of the time we scan something and it's done. As for what happens with that, either I put it on put it on YouTube or I haven't really put a lot of stuff on archive.org, but like I sh probably should put more stuff on there. Just restoration projects, we've not done that many other than scanning stuff. And I would, I don't, I want to, I want to get your guys' opinion on this. So if I were to post something like in, in its entirety, but it wasn't restored, it was just the scan. So it has all the dirt, it has all the scratches, it has all the, all that crap on it. Would you be okay with that? Or would you like prefer if, obviously you'd prefer it, but like knowing now how long it takes and like how little time we have to dedicate to it, like, would you be okay with like just uploads of raw stuff? Like, like no frills, like nothing, just scan. Would that be like fine with you guys? For for me personally, yes. Because you one of the things you mentioned on Twitter was this um my little flying fish is sick um thing, the um the mm -hmm. uh H bomb video. And I was just like, I have to see this. <laughs> and yep. it's Yes, and I was I was actually gonna get to that. Um we I was I was wondering whether we should actually restore it because it is like Dr. Slump, it is full of those vertical, ugly scratches that I don't think we can remove, like, t in a timely manner. So I was wondering if, like, I should just post that, like, in its raw form. Because we scanned it. The scan isn't great, so I think we're going to go back and rescan it. But, it, I mean, I have it, like, and I can upload it at whenever I want to. And I was just wondering, like, what are... I might, I might actually post a, a uh, poll on Twitter once this yeah. goes out that if if we were to post like our lost media sp especially just without restoration if people would like not mind it because as we've gotten farther in time we've realized like we can't restore yeah. everything <laughs> but this yeah. media still needs to go out you know yeah, it still yeah. be, be seen by people because it's lost so 
as for me, I would also agree that I would like to see it, not just because it is lost media, but also because if I see it before in full, I can have a much greater appreciation for whatever you post, end up posting later, all the small snippets to, to fully see how it's transformed from its original state to its post, uh, post word work state. But of course, the appeal of lost media will always be fascinating. Like if we ever got that lost JoJo OVA, I, I would mm-hmm. want to see that no matter what it was and no matter in what condition it was. Right. And I don't want to like, I don't want to like hold things hostage just because oh, well, we'll restore it someday, mm-hmm. you know? So I was, I was really like thinking like, maybe we should just get that out. Like, without any work done to it because i just looking at how beat up the the print is i feel like that'll take an eternity to fix yeah and, and fans are just greedy anyway <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> I think we've sort of danced around it enough. Um, would you mind just sort of recapping what the, the Daikon situation is for anyone who uh, has somehow not heard about this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there's a there's a Polygon article that's going up uh, soon, I think, that will explain um, the situation in more detail, but I will go on ahead and explain what's going on. Okay, I'll, I'll, ma- I'll make sure to link to that uh, when we post this. Yes. Okay, so basically, this project, uh, Daikon Three, was a was a fan made, um, like DIY anime short film done by a bunch of college kids, who would later go on to found Gainax, the animation studio that made Evangelion and all this. Like, yeah, we've done we've just done three episodes about Gainax, so uh, hopefully people are well aware of Gainax's <laughs> <Okay>. importance. <laughs> So, yeah, this was, like, the very first thing they ever, like, the core team that founded that studio they made. Yeah. And it was, like, really well-received and really well-made well, well made for, like, a zero-budget production. And so, until, like, now, it's just been in this constant state of limbo where it had unofficial releases on VHS, Betamax, Laserdisc, all that stuff. Um, but no one really thought to restore it from the eight millimeter print which it was sold um as unofficially yeah takada in his memoirs point said that they actually made a tidy profit out of this copyright infringement <laughs> mm-hmm. and and so we were like okay well we 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 found someone with a with a film print of it an eight millimeter which is likely one of those that were sold um to the uh public um as what they what gynax called at the time the relief fund or whatever it is so yeah we got one of those we scanned it and all this time we've been working not like full time around the clock or anything but just in our spare time just restoring it uh we got all the dirt and scratches out which is crazy to me like if you see some of those comparisons where like one frame will be like completely covered in tape and then in in the um the compare the restore comparison is like it's crazy how like and uh, it was uh, able to be removed so well i i usually do this work but for this project i didn't i i um i was mainly just coordinating everything getting the scan prepared like communicating between parties and stuff uh, but the guy who um did the removal on everything the like the cleanup was my my scanner um who I, I should I should shout him out. He's Quaza97 on Twitter. Yeah. He's around a lot on our posts and stuff. But uh yeah, so we we cleaned it up like very well, I would say, and the color correction was coming along very, very, very nicely. Um and then we made a grave mistake, which many have pointed out to me that it was a grave mistake and I should have known better, which, you know, I completely understand where they're coming from. I talked about releasing it. This fan project, you're not supposed to do that. You just drop yeah. it and that's it. <laughs> but because of the limbo this film has been in for so long, like, you know, the copyright is just all over the place. Like, there are so many IPs that were referenced and and so many, like, so much copyright infringement within this production itself that I thought it was no big deal to, like, sh- like, like talk about it openly because... I mean, there are so many versions of Daikon 3 on YouTube already. There's AI upscales and like all this crazy stuff that people try to do with it. And so I thought it was totally fine to to just just, you know, 
talk about it. And for a while it was. And then Gainax was like, you know, nope, we are not doing this. <laughs> I, I, I have to confess, it's been a little bit of a... Um sort of um like the what do you call it the uh the conspiracy board thing on one of the discord channels i am to try and figure out which member of gainax it was but we won't but we but we won't ask we won't ask you to 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 answer that yeah i can't tell you who specifically it was out of privacy concerns but i can tell you that it was none of those branches that uh, like do shady stuff um or anything so Gynex, after that that 2020 scandal they had, they reorganized um, and they are now run by facets yeah. of Kara and facets of um, the other people that basically have their like the IPs now. They yeah. basically took control of Gynex, um, and so one of the people who actually worked on Dicon Three when you know back in 1981 one of the founding members of Gynax, like this is like yeah. one of the, of the OGs through the Gynax um, name. They reached out to me personally and asked me, please don't, don't, re- don't release this. And like, in, instead of like a, um, like a corporate, like notice that it was like, like a yeah. legal notice. Like you, if we do this, if you do this, we will sue you kind of thing. It was more like, like a personal, like, please just like, we want to be the ones that restore these films and release them and because we feel like it is our mission to keep them alive and stuff. And they, he, he, the person really did like, like emphasize the fact that they want to be the ones to, to take command of this mission. And I was like, you know what? I, I feel like I completely understand that sentiment. And I decided, you know, it wasn't like he was threatening me if I released it. Like I still could, can if I want to, but I feel like with all the puzzle pieces that are that have shown to me with with that email correspondence and some other stuff that I've noticed, including that documentary about Hideaki Anno, I think I think that they are planning on a restoration, their like their own restoration. And I think that's why they reached out to me. And I have other evidence too. Yeah. And I believe for, um, what was it? Blue Blazes. Um, they had done like some restoration work for that. And so I guess we can take it as at least a plausible <laughs> that they would do so. And at least they went through like a personal channel rather than just Haha, DMC, suck it. Yeah, and no. And it, and it was a very personal email. Like, mm very like it, it it it's it just it's just kind of like i made it made me feel bad for for this guy because like guy next has had it rough the past <laughs> well year the past decade maybe <laughs> maybe they'll be the comeback story of this decade maybe uh, they'll they'll finally make uh honey mice too they'll make die <laughs> three and it'll all be great who knows yeah, and um <clears throat> so i also want to say that a few days after this happened a and a Twitter account by the name of Film underscore Daikon uh, followed Femboy Films, and it is claiming that it is an official account, and it is claiming that it is run by the same person who reached out to me. So, like, use that information how you will they haven't tweeted anything they haven't said anything and no one official follows them at the moment Mm -hmm. so right now i'm taking it with a grain of salt but if Mm -hmm. they do announce something it will most likely be soon so i would i'm gonna be on the lookout for that and if they if, if they are planning on a release releasing a restoration like like okay, that's great. Like my yeah. project is completely useless now. And like, I'm glad that I decided not to do it, but mm. time will tell. Um, I, I, I hope that they come out with something like in the next month. Otherwise I'm not sure what this could mean at all, or if it's even legit. So just to like, sort of maybe wrap this a little bit up, how do you think this is sort of going to impact your restoration efforts for other projects? Is, are you thinking it's just going to be drops from now on and less of the look at what we're doing on Twitter. 
Well, the thing is, as long as I don't say we're releasing anything, yeah. I can still like post screenshots of stuff. But I think that's the key. Don't say you're putting anything out. And so from now on, I've learned my lesson. I'm <laughs> never going to like say, oh, we're releasing this on this date. So look out for it. Nah, it's all going to be drops from now on. Um, I'll probably what the plan is going to be is I'll put like a clip on YouTube or something and then it'll link to an archive.org listing where you can like download it or whatever, depending on what it is. It's considering our YouTube uh, has a bit of a following now. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a good idea. But yeah, we're not going to make that same mistake again, especially not for something so historically important <laughs> yeah, yeah, and for any lost media, really. So, so I, I guess like uh, I just a few final things about like maybe like the future of restoration, if I can be so grand. Like, do you think that, say, the people who are going to be restoring, I don't know, sort of online 40 years from now <laughs> are going to have it harder or easier than the people like yourself who are doing stuff? with the media four years ago i guess it depends because as we go forward film is going to fade more and more if it's not even if it's like stored properly in the right conditions and the ideal conditions ultimately it will still fade it, it's just by storing it properly you're you are delaying the inevitable mm. you are not preventing the inevitable so as we move forward in time, it will be harder to restore stuff, sure. But it also depends on software engineers and how, how you know, maybe AI will even, like, be, be a defining factor of this. But, like, maybe software uh, solutions will be better than they are now. Maybe, maybe film restoration, so, like... At, software for animation will be optimized and we won't have to deal with those stupid uh issues with mm. with frames on ones anymore uh i just think it, we just have to wait and see right now it, people are kind of frantic because like they're trying to get everything digitized that they can studios and and people like us too um whether that be because the official releases are crap or because you know, they just want to archive something that, that that they shot like 40 years ago on a Super 8 camera or whatever that means a lot to them. It's 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 of the time is of the essence, I think. And if I can do whatever I can to um to help that mission, then I will do whatever I can to ensure that. Uh, that's yeah. <laughs> so I mean, you, you sort of maybe you've maybe like hinted at it slightly, but like, what do you think the great pitfalls or mistakes that like official restorations either in the west or japanese have been falling into um has it mostly been lack of knowledge is it software is it just they don't understand what the public wants uh it's a little bit of everything and this this applies to both um western and japanese a lot of the time you're you get a like a nice film scan or something and for some for whatever reason they decide that consumers don't like grain which to an extent, some don't, but most of those people are very uneducated uh, about the film medium, and they expect everything to look as modern as it as it does today, which just isn't the case. So they'll go ahead and they'll scrub everything free of grain, which isn't isn't a bad thing in and of itself. But when it starts to delete like real details that existed before, that's when I when I draw the line. And that's when a lot of people start drawing the line. So a classic example of this is Dragon Ball Z from the beginning. Like you had these this these DVDs that were like, you know, they're par for the course. And then they 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 come out with they cancel a release they're currently doing. And um to replace them with like these brand new super high definition remastered dvds in widescreen and it's like first of all this 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 show was was made in four by three <laughs> why are you cropping it like what is the reason for this and secondly they're saying this is all digitally remastered and like you know it it's it's how it's supposed to be seen and yet you get like <laughs> actual lines being erased and actual animation being deleted because their filtering is just so aggressive that it's detecting real details as like artifacts that should be removed and the lack of quality control and the and the fact that they still made millions of dollars despite all their problems just convinces companies that 
they can get away with all this cheap, fast uh, pseudo restoration, as I like to call it, and they can easily make a quick buck out of it, which sadly is true for the most part. Disney yeah. is notoriously um, guilty of the same thing. Um, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, uh, Sword in the Stone, all of those, if you buy those Blu-rays, like, they are so... Like, you can't even, like, they don't even look like the same movie anymore, you know? It's like, it's like they're, they're, what I feel like this is, is it's the revisionism of history. And that's where I think that not just companies, but also consumers should be aware that these things are products of their time. And so, in my opinion, they should be presented as they were when they were released, whether it's censorship that kind of makes ruins it or this like deleting of details that were there before because they want to make it look more modern, whatever it is, I feel like a lot of the time, um, and this is, this is also notorious in live action too. Like, you know, you see that 4k of Terminator two and it looks absolutely terrible. The, the live action sort of crime that I think of is with what they did to Buffy because it was shot for a specific size of TV screen, and then, but they used cameras that could show you much more of the detail, and then they're like, oh, well, why don't we show them that? And now you see all the boom mics and the people off the side, and it's just like, no, that's not what we wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Buffy is, is a recent example of that, yeah. For me, it's always the Simpsons one, where they just threw it in uh, 16 by 9 and just cropped the top bits and the bottom bits off, and cut out a bunch of the jokes right yeah you you lose a lot of visual humor that way Mm -hmm. and uh and uh disney it was it caused such a controversy on disney plus that they actually added the ability to go back to four by three but that doesn't help the fact that it still looks terrible because all the detail is gone Mm -hmm. but the thing about the simpsons and this is going off on a tangent so forgive me but it was shot on 35 millimeter, but it was edited on edited on video. So you can't really, unless you go back and take all the original camera negatives and re-edit it from scratch, it's going to be impossible to get it looking like <laughs> great. Um, I think there's just one final question that we need to ask, and that is, why the name Fanboy Films? Okay, so uh, there's a bit of a joke about me personally as a as a person and don't take this the wrong way okay but <laughs> for some reason there, there's just this this joke that people would just call me femboy for some reason okay and i'm not sure why i guess i kind of like maybe maybe i give up give off that vibe online but i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but like just people would just like whenever I'd make like post something on Discord, people would just like or like a meme or something, people would just at me femboy and this I would be just completely disregarded and like, okay, fair. Uh okay, it's a it's a personal nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much it's a personal thing. And so we were trying to think of a of a name for the group, and then someone was just like femboy films. And I'm like, that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> Well, it certainly sticks out. I have to confess, though, I've I've been following like the Daikon project for months, but I never followed you on Twitter because I'm like, do I want to follow an account called Fanboy Films? Oh, that's completely understandable. And like so many, so many people, so many like just today, I was followed by someone called Fanboy Computer Building, and like it's this account where they like they're a fanboy who builds computers, which is kind of awesome. But like the fact that all these like accounts follow. <laughs> I'm not sure what they expect and <laughs> I, and I'm not sure if they stick around or if they unfollow. I'm, I don't know, but it's really funny to me <laughs> like for, for like professional work that we've done or like clients that we've um, worked with, we don't use that name. Okay. If this name is specifically for fan projects, which mm-hmm. I think is a good distinction to make because we don't want to get, we don't want to get our fan work in mixed in with like like legitimate work that we do because if if people know you're a pirate they will never hire you kind of thing <laughs> you know this just makes me think that in the future we'll get a c- cute femboys doing cute things anime <laughs> that'd be that'd be awesome i'd be so so 
I'd be, I'd be, I'd very, I'd very much support such a thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, thank you, David. Uh, you're doing sterling work. These sorts of remastering projects, they really sort of dispel myths about how Definitely. like these things looked in the past. Uh, and it's just a wonderful thing for anyone to be doing. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you guys for your input about if you're okay with raw scans being uploaded in, in, you know, instead of, like, tedious restoration work, because while we still plan on doing that with very scarce projects, we would like to get a lot of the stuff that we have out there, especially if it's in desperate need uh, for, for lost media like the Flying Fish one. I was really um wondering what to do with it whether we should tackle it or not and i think that maybe i found an answer for some of the stuff that needs needs exposure but we don't have the time to really like like fix up you know so before we leave off like do you just want to plug yourself like where can people find you if they have like old films they want to restore how would they contact you things like that Okay, so yeah, we're mainly on Twitter. That is our biggest thing. We we're not really anywhere else other than YouTube. Um we don't have a public Discord server. I I don't know if we will we we will make one or not. It's just because some of the stuff that we have is like just very um confidential and stuff. <laughs> so, um we we have we have a co- a coffee where you can donate um two dollars coffee not we don't ask for anything else uh, i put my money where my mouth is and donated <laughs> uh and we're on youtube where we post uh little little scans here and there sometimes bigger stuff like uh and we we always we always uh update on twitter we all whenever something's going up on youtube or something dropped on youtube we have an archive.org page but we uh, haven't really utilized it that much yet there right now you can find stuff like the uh, live action negatives of that commercial the live action glico snack commercial that we found a long time ago and also the full uh restoration of the uh uh american pop trailer which you can't find on youtube so um that's basically where you can find us if you want to send in a film that you want scanned or whatever you can contact us via uh twitter our dms are open or if you so feel so inclined you can email us at femboyfilms at gmail.com we normally don't get email inquiries but if it's there if you need it and um yeah we're always open to discussing stuff with fans and uh if you have a question or anything, just don't feel free to to add us on Twitter. We'll get back to you very swiftly and hopefully with the answer you're looking for. Um, I know that a lot of this stuff is new to people in the in the in recent years, and like I try to be as helpful as I can uh, educating people about film. So I hope that uh, we see you around um, on Twitter and wherever else on the internet you scour. And uh, we will be coming up with some stuff uh, soon enough. I, I hope. I hope anyway. Yeah, yep. I certainly learned a lot today. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. Very interesting. We are the Anime Research Group, a fortnightly podcast coming out every other Thursday. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Goodbye.